that day I live in a dream Welcome to Only Trying to Help, the podcast where we try to help you be helpful to other people. My name is Kate Watson, and I am joined with two colleagues who you may know very well. Um, I'm going to let you introduce yourselves. I'm Elizabeth McElroy. My two friends slash colleagues here often uh, call me Biz, which is fine. And I am a therapist right outside Philadelphia. And my name is Meg Rogers. I am also a therapist right outside of Philadelphia. Um, to the listeners, you may remember Elizabeth and Meg from our episodes on boundaries. And we also did one on how to find a therapist. Um, and so, you know, if you, if you're thinking these voices sound familiar, they, they sure are. And, um, today I've asked Elizabeth and Meg to join me for a conversation about crying. And, and when I approached them about this, I was hesitant because I thought, does anybody really want to listen to a podcast about crying? And immediately the three of us had all these ideas of things we could say about this. So um, I'm I'm hoping no one's, you know, turning this off and going to some comedy podcast instead. (laughs) Hang with us, hang with us, because I I think, you know, we're going to, we're going to do this justice or I hope we do. And I want to start us off with, just a little bit of some science that I read in an article that was put out by Harvard Medical School. And the title of it was, is crying good for you? And the short answer is yes. Um, But I I think there's a little bit more to know about that, that there are actually different kinds of tears. So there are the more like reflexive tears. And those are the kinds that just sort of flush debris from your eyes. And and these are the kinds of tears you might have, like if you eat spicy food or if you're chopping an onion. We're going to focus more on the emotional tears. And what I really want our audience to know is that emotional tears are productive. They are not a waste of time. They flush the stress hormone out um, that, that's really often in our way. And they release oxytocin and endorphins. And I, I just want to emphasize this point that crying those emotional tears is actually accomplishing something. Um, Because you'll hear people say like, oh, you know, don't waste your time crying. Or or often when people are trying to be helpful to others, they will say things like, don't cry, you know, wipe your tears, you know, everything's fine, Don't, don't cry. And maybe some people have even graduated to saying something like, uh, you know, it's okay to cry, but I'm going to ask us to do a lot better than just, you know, tolerating tears. We should actually be encouraging more tears. And maybe I'll just turn it over to the two of you to react. Tell me what you think about that. Are you with me or am I way off base here about crying being productive and useful and something we ought to not just tolerate, but actually encourage? Um, yes, I, the short answer is yes. I think crying is excellent. Um, I think it's also really scary for people. It's even scary. It's not scary for me when my clients cry, but I have noticed when people I love are crying that I have an immediate like fight, flight, or freeze reaction (laughs) because the people I love are not my clients, right? I have a healthy distance from my clients. So when my clients cry, it feels like a victory because as I often tell them, especially people who are grieving, If you don't process all of your emotions, including the ones that are difficult and scary and make you feel unmoored, they will find other ways to come out. So if you don't allow yourself the time and space to cry when it feels appropriate and safe, you'll be crying in the grocery store, as I have done, (laughs) or on the bus, as I have done. (laughs) And so you really want to be the one in control of when and where you're crying, I think. So that's sometimes how I try to frame it for people that Crying can be hard and it can feel really vulnerable. But if you're alone in the right safe space, then like that's the time and place. No one else has to know about it. 
I agree with that. And I'll also say, I think it's okay to cry when you feel a little out of control when other people are around too, because your body is communicating something like tears are always sharing something about your experience. And sometimes it can be hard for us as people. I think, you know, if you're a millennial, maybe older, I don't know about younger generations, you might hear, have heard a lot growing up of like, like what Kate was saying, don't cry or crying's not going to fix the spilt milk, like whatever the phrase is. Um, and so some of that panic that comes up can be those voices from our past saying like, it's not okay to cry. It's not okay to cry. It's not okay to cry. But as soon as we stop doing that and we just let the crying happen, then we can ask ourselves like, what is my body trying to tell me? What are all of the things that I've kind of separated from and haven't put language to that my body wants to let out? And I'll say like, to even take it a step further, you might be crying in the grocery store or like me, I had a long period where I was not crying, did a lot of good therapy to get to a place where I could. I had a lot of chronic pain as a result of that. Like your body will hold on to stress and tension in different ways. And so the preferred way, I think the, the way that's a lot easier is to let those tears out. I want to put a spotlight, Meg, on how some people have trouble crying. And, and, and Elizabeth, you mentioned this too, that it can be scary to cry. And, and I guess, you know, it was, it was also in that Harvard article that there are some people who have difficulty crying. And that's actually more concerning than the folks who are crying a whole lot, which was such a relief for me as a crier. I was like, oh, good. Harvard thinks I'm okay. <laughs> but, you know, for folks who are pretty sure they're sad, but can't seem to get the tears to come, you know, that can be all that can be signs of all sorts of things. None of us are here to diagnose folks who are listening, but you know, it can be a sign that someone's going through some heavy clinical depression, not saying that you as a listener, if you're not crying, that's you. I'm just saying it's something we do see when people are just having trouble accessing their tears. They can't make the tears come. Um, and I think similar to what Elizabeth said, it may even be a sign that a person is either unable or unwilling to lean into those scary emotions. And so, as Meg said, what a victory it is when you've done the work now to be able to cry, that this is a good thing. And I, I'm asking our listeners to totally rework the way they think about this. Um, and 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 I, I, I take issue when folks say, yeah, it's okay to cry. I think we say that the way we say, like, it's okay to fall down or it's okay to make mistakes. I, I want to change the way we say that. Not only is it okay, it is wonderful. It is fantastic. It is great news. And that I think we have a lot more work to do to, to reframe that. I um, often have clients, I see a lot of older people, as I've said on this podcast 105 times, um, and I have a lot of clients of, uh, you know, the kind of boomer generation who are like, well, crying is weak. And it's so frustrating to hear as a therapist, as a mother, as a person who cries a lot, <laughs> because I truly feel the opposite. I feel like if you are able to experience all of your emotions, no matter what they are in a physical way that is productive, as we said, that's a strength. That means that you're resilient. That means that you are, you know, growing emotionally as a person. That's kind of the goal, right? So I, it's very frustrating to me when people say like, well, crying is a weakness and it's very hard to, um, undo that right as all these socialized things are and especially pe people in their 60s and 70s who are raised in a totally different way and my kids are being raised in a different way than I was in terms of crying and stuff right um I it's so hard to undo that idea that crying is weak or or whatever when to me it's like it is a strength like if you can cry if you can process your feelings in a physical way that at the end of it, you feel better. That's the whole thing. That's the whole idea. I think some of the work too can be getting people in touch with their ability to cry. So I think about families that I work with, with little ones where the parents, instead of rushing to say like, it's okay, it's okay. Or stop crying to just be there with their kid, just let them be. Cause sometimes 
clients will get this message, but also kids certainly will. If we say like, it's not okay to cry or like, don't cry over that or wipe your face, anything like that. People get the message that like, it's not okay to be themselves, that they can't fully just be themselves with whoever it is that they're with. So if we are totally open to the crying and we let it happen, then we give them that experience and that's wonderful. But then I think the question is like, how do you start to give yourself that experience if there isn't somebody there to say that to you? I mean, you can start to say it to yourself. Um, I'm curious about everybody's experience with this, but I have noticed that there are more uh, resources out there for somatic exercises Um, like restorative yoga, that can be really helpful too. So sometimes it's therapy and sometimes it's just sitting quietly with your body and just letting yourself notice all of the things that happen in it, which can be scary enough as it is. You know, I I hear from people from time to time who say, is it weird that I put on that song that makes me cry just because I feel like crying? And I'm like, "Mm -mm, nope, that's not weird at all. That's a way to do this. That's one option. You know, some folks will go to therapy. Some folks will go to restorative yoga. Some folks will put on the song that they know is going to make them cry to make themselves cry or watch the movie or or go back to the memory, um, some memory that you know will make you cry. Um, That is a way to practice and get used to this feeling and and to visit it, even if you listen to 10 seconds of that song, just to visit it briefly and then come back to where it feels safe again. But this is how you can practice getting comfortable leaning into those feelings if you're not already comfortable with it. And I'm totally that person who will be like, give me that sad song. I need to have a cry. Yeah. And I think that's so important, Kate, talking about the practicing of it. And like Meg said earlier, that you know, when your body responds in whatever way it responds, right? Like we have pain receptors for a reason. We cry for a reason. We have emotions for a biological evolutionary reason. So if your body starts to cry and you try to turn it off, it feels bad. It feels so uncomfortable. You get that lump in your throat and my my eyes always burn if I'm trying not to cry. Better to just let it happen rather than make yourself physically and emotionally uncomfortable because what if someone, you know, freaks out? Mm -hmm. Right. So what if somebody freaks out? If they freak out, then maybe you've learned a little bit more about your relationship and you can make some other decisions about who you're surrounding yourself with. Easy for me to say, hot take, but something to consider. I think Meg's hot take should be like a a repeated segment on this podcast. (laughs) Hot take. Um, so I had all kinds of thoughts. Um, I'm trying to choose one, you know, I'm thinking about the, okay. So the audience here is people who want to help other people. And so listeners, you are likely in your, in your helping capacity, you are likely to find yourself in the presence of people who are tearing up and you may notice them you know, trying to hold it back. And, you know, we've all been there where you can tell this person you care about is choking down their tears the way Elizabeth just described. So what is something we can do that's maybe more helpful than saying, oh, don't cry? What's more helpful than that? I think one of the best responses I've ever had is my very good friend, Jenny, just giving me a hug and that's it. And sometimes she'll like, you know, pat me on the back or like rock a little bit. She's like a very caring individual. Um, But that's all I need. Just like somebody to say, hey, I'm here with you. That's it. And she doesn't even need to say it with words. I'm a big fan of um, that kind of physical presence and reassuring. But I also am a fan of just saying like, take your time and just letting it, you know, but giving that permission of like, we can just hang here until you're ready to tell me what's going on or until you want to switch the subject or whatever it is. Mm-hmm. Sometimes my clients will start to apologize for crying when they're in session. And then I'm usually pretty explicit about saying like, it's okay, your tears are welcome here. And just give it space until they start to regulate their breathing a little bit and feel like they're, because you can kind of see somebody when they're in that tear pattern, they kind of reach a, 
a moment where it's most intense and then they start to soothe out a little bit. So I just wait for that. I often have clients tell me, I never cry until I see you. <laughs> and <then> they laugh. <laughs> and I just say, well, I'm, I'm glad. I think it's good. I think if this is the space you need, then you can spend the whole 50 minutes crying. Like that's, this is the container, right? Some people need the container to feel safe and need the dedicated time and space because there is no other time and no other space. So, okay, it can be in your therapist's office. I once cried in a meeting, <laughs> you know, like here I am saying crying's wonderful. Everyone should cry more. Let's all cry together. And yet like in a professional meeting, it feels like, oh, this is really the one moment I for sure did not want to cry. And, um, you know, it was probably like seven of us around a boardroom table, you know, and, and I, I became emotional. I was crying and someone all the way across the table looked at me and said, thank you for your tears. Thank you. And I was like, wow, I've never been thanked for crying, but I, I didn't, that wasn't even confusing to me. Like I understood why she was thanking me. It just had never happened to me before. And I've considered that as a response. Like, why not thank a person for offering this in into the space of, of trusting and being brave enough and going for it um, and just saying, thank you for your tears. Thank you for that. That's amazing, Kate. I, as soon as you started that story, I like felt my shoulders creep up to my ears and just that like, and like crawl into my body. Like the, I have cried at work so many times and it is always embarrassing, even though as it's ha like, I have no, I truly have no control over it. It is just happening. It is just how I react when I am frustrated or angry, right? I don't yell. I just burst into tears. And it took me many years to just say like, well, this is how I am. And I'll, I'll leave the room and I'll excuse myself. And later I'll explain like, when I get really overwhelmed, I cry. Now I'm okay. Now we can talk. And I just like, I have accepted this part of my personality. And Meg, you said it earlier, like if someone that you're talking to can't handle the fact that you're getting emotional or crying, that's their issue. That has nothing to do with me. I am having the response I'm having and I'm gonna try to work through it. And then whatever, however you wanna deal with that is none of my business. <laughs> I, you see me nodding, Elizabeth. It's because I think what we're touching on is just like, social stigma of being a woman crying in a workplace and the pressures that we feel to be quote unquote professional. And, you know, the three of us are here advocating that crying is great. Everyone should cry. And yet I'll bet we've all known the feeling of, oh, but not here, <laughs> like, right? not, not in this space. Um, so anyway, when that person thanked me for my tears, it was as sort of a profound moment for me. Back to the question of how can we be helpful when someone is is crying? Um, let's take it out of a, a clinical example or a professional example. You know, when it's my family member or my best friend, um, I will, similar to what both of you have said, I will go in for the hug and just kind of hold the person. But I also like to say, like, keep going, you know, like more. The Like, because when you start to hear them go, I'm, I'm okay. I'm okay. I go mm, more. <laughs> I, I think more tears. Yeah. I think uh, grandma, classic grandma responses, let it out. Right. I think we've heard that before. I heard that once when I was delivering my second child, <laughs> the midwife leaned over and went, just let it out. And I was so angry about the giving birth, which I think anyone who has given birth can relate. <laughs> I was, I was not, I was just crying out of like sheer rage at the thing that was happening to me. And I did really appreciate, it was like a little too crunchy for me, but after the fact, I did appreciate that she was just going to hang out there and just be like, yep, cry away. And I was like, no, I'm mad at you too. Well, I mean, I do get people in my life and myself where rage tears are totally a thing. So they might not want to hug. Uh, right. Like if we're feeling really angry at the midwife or whoever, I think the last thing I would want is to be touched by them. So sometimes giving a little bit of space and asking, you know, what, what do you need? Or again, watch to see what their body is doing. 
are you getting cues that say this is a sign where my friend needs some comfort or my loved one needs some comfort or is this a sign where I sit and I wait and I just don't judge them I think the waiting is definitely key because it is such a vulnerable experience to cry in front of someone else I think having the patience and the grace to just sit and wait until the storm kind of passes and then to say do you want to talk about it how do you feel now you know like whenever we're uncomfortable i think the best bet is to meet with curiosity right unless you feel unsafe obviously but when you just feel uncomfortable because other people are having big feelings around you i think doing that um what is it called when you you co-regulate right so like you are the calmest person in the room and you can say to your friend or loved one or whoever, like, what's going on? What brought that on? What's tell me more? Or do you not want to talk about it? Or or I'm ready to talk about it if and when you want to. Um, Elizabeth, when you said the point about co-regulating and being like the calmer person, uh, I, I often feel like I live my life in that role, like in most settings that I'm in, like I'm the calm, steady one that everyone will just sort of like, you know, relax down to. But once in a while, I feel like it might actually be helpful to someone if I join them in the crying. And I and I wonder what each of you think about that. And again, maybe not with your therapist hat on necessarily, just, you know, like we're all friends, you know, if. If you call me crying and I start crying too, thoughts about that? Because it's something I, I, I like to lean into from time to time. Like, hey, let's both cry. So I'll tell a personal story, if that's okay. I um, went to a funeral a couple weeks ago for a very, very dear friend's mother who had died. And I walked into the church. And as soon as my girlfriend and I saw each other, we both burst into tears and threw our arms around each other and just cried and cried and cried. And she, I can count on one hand the number of times this friend has cried in front of me. It's not something she does. (laughs) But in that moment, to share our grief, which obviously is different. She lost her mom. I lost my mom many years ago, but you know, it's whatever. Here we are two motherless adults (laughs) who don't feel like adults because of this painful painful grief, just like holding each other and sobbing. It was, it's one of the most precious moments of our 30 year friendship. I would say there's really some power in expressing a big emotion together. Like think about when you and your friends get the giggles really bad, you know, and you feel like insane because you cannot stop laughing until you cry. Actually, (laughs) to me, it's like the same side, a different side of the same coin right? Is that you're having this big physical reaction together. And that's what, um, that's what makes intimacy grow and, and what makes us feel safe and connected to each other again, like biologically on purpose. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't, I don't know that I see any issue. I mean, I've heard people say things like it was my time to cry or like they, um, they made themselves the center of attention. Like I've heard kind of those stories. Um, But I mean, if it's coming from this place of shared experience and mutual care, I think most people understand and can pick that up when it's happening. Um, Yeah. Sympathetic crying, I think is it builds connection. And I've recommended like, do you want to just both have a good cry together? Um, But like, if you don't want to do that right now, we don't have to do that right now, but I, I've recommended it. Like it's an option. We can sit here and talk. We can sit here and breathe. We can sit here and cry. We can go take a walk. Um, but like, I'm willing to do whatever you're doing. Um, you know, that's maybe sort of the approach I, I often take. This is bringing to mind an interesting cultural tradition in Ireland for funerals. They have keeners or historically had keeners which were usually women who would come to the funeral and or wake process. And their job was to cry really loudly, really passionately for extended periods of time. And so you would have these people keening and kind of inviting this feeling, but also at the wakes, there were like games and other things that were very intentional about feeling different kinds of feelings 
in this space of greed. And I think that's interesting because I'm sure that's not the only culture that has this standard of like, we create time and space to cry together and to feel our feelings fully in the many different ways that they show up. So I think that's pretty beautiful. <laughs> I recall reading a story um, that ch in traditional Chinese families, and I wanna say a few generations ago, but traditionally there would be paid mourners. And so it was a, a status symbol to say, so many people are crying for this person. They were so beloved. It was like a, a way to honor your loved one to be like, see all these people are like sobbing. Mm. And I think about that. All, I think often about how other cultures are like, do things a little differently around mm -hmm. <laughs> grief and big emotions and how helpful it can be and how normal it can be to just emote in public. Whereas some of us, you know, have the Irish Catholic side. And some of us have the uptight waspy side and makes crying tough. Yeah, I do think culturally there are a lot of differences around the um, acceptance of big emotions versus the promotion of composure um, and and what's considered um, proper to be composed um, and, and in control of oneself. And those things are going to vary a lot around the world. Um, and so I think it's worth noting that like this episode is not going to capture all the different cultural nuances, but um, it's worth reflecting on, especially for listeners who have diverse groups of friends. Uh, you might take some of the things we've said and try to like use this in your social settings and realize, well, this is missing the mark entirely. Um, and it feels, if it feels that way, like you and your friends are just not understanding each other uh, when it comes to how we emote, there could be a cross-cultural difference there. Can I say something about the Kelsey brothers? Yeah, I, I want that. <laughs> Very important to me. <laughs> uh, my husband, my husband is a big sports fan, and he often laughs at me because my favorite moments in sports are when grown men are crying. So we are Sixers fans in this house, and so a couple years ago, when the Sixers lost um, in the playoff game, Joel Embiid cried. And it's worth noting that he was raised in Africa until he was like thirteen, so he has a different cultural outlook in life. <laughs> uh, he's he was raised in Cameroon, I should say. Um, but I think nothing is more powerful than to see this seven foot tall, extremely strong black man weeping because he's sad and frustrated. And that's, and he was experiencing that emotion in real time. And same with the Kelsey brothers, these big burly men who look like they could like pick me up in one hand, like a cheerleader are crying when Jason Kelsey retires and his brother is sitting next to him weeping because he has moved by this milestone and like I just I just am so glad that that my kids get to see that men are okay are allowed to cry that big strong men sometimes cry because emotions are universal and kind of so spin off of that and then back to the Harvard article men suffer because they've been socialized in our culture to not cry and we see it with heart disease and we see it with loneliness and then the chronic stress that's associated with that. So uh, I think people who are socialized as women get to have more spaces where we can connect with each other and we can feel these deep feelings. And I really hope that men get that opportunity and feel that they can create that opportunity. I, I think that there's a shift happening. I hope that there's a shift happening. We are three strong feminists who also know how we have failed men terribly in this society. Um, and there are books upon books written about how sexism ultimately hurts men. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, look at rates of violence and who's committing most of our violent crime. I can't help but wonder what's happened to our boys Um that, that they seem to be the perpetrators. So this has clearly spun off into another episode. <laughs> but yes, if only young men and young boys um, had the space to process emotions that that young women sometimes get. Um, we also know we, we're not allowed to do that in the workplace, <laughs> but but we might we might have a little bit more room to do it at home or with our friends, things like that. Yeah. Okay, so if I were to bring it together, 
what we're saying is crying is not just okay, it is good. Cry more, not less. <laughs> um, encourage others to cry more, not less. And maybe that's the gist. Yeah, and when someone is crying, you don't have to ring the five alarm fire bell. You can just wait it out. Because you're okay as you are. They're okay as they are. We're all good enough. Okay. And you could be uncomfortable for a minute. Listen, it's the least you could do. You know, you care about someone who's like maybe suffering. The least you could do is be a little uncomfortable, you know, for their benefit. Yeah. Maybe that should be the name of this podcast instead of only trying to help. It should be, it's the least you could do. <laughs> but with some very passive aggressive topics too, I feel. Right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the least you could do is RSVP when someone invites you to an event. <laughs> oh my God. It's the least you could do. Um, all right, friends. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I mean, because every time we get together, we end up drifting into a new topic. You could probably expect that I'll be asking you to come back on to talk about that topic. Um, but in the meantime, I just want to thank, thank you again for always sharing your your ideas so generously with, with the audience. It's a pleasure. Thank you so much for having us. It's so fun. Since that day I live in a dream